All right, my name is David Ahern, and I work for Cumulus Networks. And I wanted to uh, walk through how to use the VRF um, implementation that was added to the Linux kernel this past summer. So how many people are familiar with the VRF concept or what's going on? A few people, yeah? OK. Awesome. So I'll start with a quick overview of <coughs> what has been implemented kernel features and such, and then just get into use cases. And, you know, I've got some simulations running which show, you know, a lot of the concepts and can see the commands and stuff. So definitely for every use case, if you have questions, you know, let's stop, let's run commands, let's, you know, show you what's going on. So the virtual routing and forwarding concept is really just about using multiple network routing tables. And you've got interfaces, network interfaces, like the front panel ports on a switch that you want to associate route lookups with particular tables. So an implementation using modeling the VRF as a layer three net device was added to the Linux kernel this past summer. And similar to a bridge, you would create a VRF device and enslave any of the interfaces to that layer three master device and then any packets going through that route lookups for those interfaces are associated with a specific table that's, that's associated with the master device. From an application's perspective, what's expected is to use the, the SO bind to device paradigm as a way of binding a socket to that L3 domain so that packets and, and route lookups are using the proper, the proper table. And the, an important thing here is that what VRF is, is an L3 concept. We're really going after manipulating the route lookups. We're not looking at, you know, necessarily a tight security model or device separation, which is more of the, the namespace type implementation. So features by kernel version, the, the initial IPv4 support was added into the 4.4, or 4.3 kernel. And then the next release got IPv6 support and then this current version, version 4.5, has uh, what I call um, a VRF global socket capability. So essentially you can have one process that has a listen socket and it can take connections over any of the L3 domains. And then those child sockets that are derived from it are bound to the L3 domain that the packet originated on. And then one important um, comment here is that in addition to an updated kernel to use the features, you also need an updated IP route too. So what are some of the advantages? Why a net device? So really it comes back to the, the net device is one of the key modeling elements, networking elements for the Linux kernel. And it's, it's a way of providing an anchor for addresses, for TCP dump or packet capture programs. It allows you to put um, net filter rules or traffic, traffic classification rules. It, it gives something to anchor those, those concepts to. And another thing is that you can layer L3 or VRFs within namespaces, which are an L1 separation. So namespaces go about dividing things at a device layer and up. The VRF is going at separating things at the L3, at the route layer. So the, conceptually, the, the basics are just create a device. When you create that device, it gets associated with a table. You set up your FIB rules, which as it's doing the route lookups, say that, oh, this is a, a master device. I need this OIF means I need to go to this table ID to do my lookup. So with that created, you then enslave a device to it. And then from that point on, the packets that come in that enslaved device are redirected to the VRF device so that when an application has a socket bound to it, the packets will flow into it. Okay? So that fundamentally is was what's taking place. So there are quite a few steps that's needed to set up and create a, a VRF domain. And I do want to simplify this, um, looking at maybe having like an IP VRF subcommand where you can just do a VRF add and it'll do most of the stuff behind the scenes. But essentially what we're doing here is 
adding the device, adding an alias to IP route 2's conf file so you can do table to name conversions, inserting the rules for both IPv4 and IPv6, the FIB rules, which direct the lookups, and then IP uh, default routes in that table. So as you create a, a new VRF device, it's really good to have a, a default <coughs> route for that table. Otherwise, it'll fall through to the next table. And then set the device up. Because if the device is down, packets will not flow through the, through the entire VRF. So in later slides, when I have the shortcut VRF create, this is what I mean. This is the set of commands that's getting run when you see that. All right, so let's just dive right into use cases. And so VRF has, very, uh, has uh, uh, a few standardized deployment implementations, and one of those is management VRF. So what we're going after here is this, this notion of separating your management traffic from your data plane traffic. You've got front panel ports. You want those to be associated with, with a table. You've got management interfaces, um, Puppet, Chef, SNMP, NTPD, DHCP, all these kind of things that you want to go out the management interface. So the first thing you got to do is create your, you create your management verf, associate it with an alternative table, set the management interface, which is ETH0, into the VRF device, and then from that point on, you're, you've got a working, a working management verf. And so to show you that, I have a simulation going here, and with this rather low-resolution monitor, we'll be doing a lot, of, a lot of window flipping back and forth. So get to the right window here. All right, so this is my, my switch. And by default, or I should say not by default yet, so this, this is really a virtual machine with eight um, SWP ports, so eight front panel ports modeled, and it has a, uh, a management interface to go with that. So that's, that's ETH0. So we've got ETH0 here, and then several front panel ports, or to use the abbreviated version of the show, which is still too wide for this low red screen. But anyway, go with the idea here. So when you look at the main table, you see the front panel ports are all, all the routes and the connected routes associated with the front panel ports are in the main table. So by default, Quagga or anything else running is going to be looking at these tables. But if you wanted to use an application going out, the management VRF, you would have to look at the management table. Okay. So here you can see the default route for the management interface, the connected routes, anything else that you want to do. So the, the next problem becomes, well, how do you run a process in that management verf context? So you have to either bind to that device. So for example, ping dash capital I is saying, do a socket bind a device to VRF management. And let's ping the the management uh, gateway, okay? So you can see the traffic's going out that. But, ah, uh, crap. Clearly I'm on console. <laughs> Let me restart the, uh, the virtual machine. We'll start that over again. And I will get a different login. So we're all good. Now let me uh, get out of that. Okay. Now I won't kill anything when I uh, do a control C. <sighs> okay. So now another another thing is coming into the box. So if you noticed, I'm coming in on. Port 22, I did an SSH end of the box, 
which my old alias is uh, just using SSH lab, which means I don't care about the key and I'm gonna run SSH for that IP address. So I've used SSH to come into the, the VM and I'm coming in through the management interface. So you can see here that I'm bound to port 22 and this is an example of using that VRF global where I've got one SSHD instance and when the connection came through the VRF management domain, that socket became bound to that domain automatically. So I didn't have to keep spinning off SSHDs per domain. So SSK <coughs> bound dev if equals the VRF? Yes. Okay, so if you do SS-T, it'll say that it's bound to that whatever. This version, yep, there you go. Oh, there you go. So yeah, yeah. I didn't I didn't realize I'd updated SST yeah. or SS in this. Slash ping is over. I'm sorry. Ping, ping minus i is also patched. No, no. No, no. So ping has always had the dash i for IPv4 ping is a binded device. Ping six uses uh, packet info to set. Until it puts an interface binder. Yep. So that would be the other one. Oops. So if I were to do a ping six on I think that's the address. Yep. Nope. All right, I have to go back and look at what I used. I had different I have different addresses for front panel ports versus management interface. But uh, the ping six, I can show that on, a, on another demo that ping six works as well. Here, actually, let's. Oh, I know what I didn't do. I know what I didn't do. Okay, anyway, we'll come back to that one in a later demo. From a rules perspective, I mentioned that there were rules in place. <coughs> and I ran a script that I didn't need to for this one. But here is essentially the two rules that tell the management, that, that create the management VRF and tell those lookups to go to the management table. What's the II rule for? I mean, if you're forwarding. Coming in through the SWP interface and the device gets switched from SWP1, or in this case, E0, to VRF management device. So now the IAF is um, VRF management. And no, so you're- Before you add that VR, if you deleted that IAF, what would stop working? Anything? Nothing? Yes, right now, not working. <laughs> right now, nothing. Right, I can imagine if you're trying to forward packets in from we'll the VRF out to the VRF. Delete. Okay. So now if we came back to the host OS. Okay. And so if I put that back. Someone start a git refresh, downloading a repository. Anyway, networking will come back in a second. And does this mean that uh, autocon, IPv6 autocon, happens on the VR as well? Yes. VRA hits zero, and then autocon slash happens on the VRA. I can get this thing to come back to me. Yes. I'm sorry. Will it continue to work that you remove the rule? No. So you broke my Yeah, so that's why I'm... <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. You're right. Thank you. So yes, networking stopped, as I said. <laughs> that was a very important thing to remind me on. So I should go to... Like the root lookup should just look at the local table if it's going to local address. 
Okay. Well, look at that. Networking's back. Yay. So there you go. It's so both the ingress and the the egress are needed from a rules perspective to direct the packets to the right management or the right VRF table. And then similarly, there are uh, IP6 rules. these guys. So, same thing. All right. So, network namespaces aren't used at all? MPR? No. Nope. So, when you configure addresses on a slave device, does it go, do the routes go both to the VRF table and the main table, or just to the VRF table? Just to the VRF table. Mm -hmm. So, if you're looking at the main table, you see these are, there's nothing in here related to ETH0. And if you look at the management table, you'll see both the local routes and table. Thank you. So you see both the local routes and the connected routes. So everything associated with the VRF is in the VRF table. And then looking at the local table, See, nothing in there, these are all associated with the SWP ports, nothing is, in loopback, nothing is associated with ETH0. So it's a complete movement of, of things to the, to the VRF table. So you have to set the master prior adding addresses, right? Otherwise the routes will enter the main table. Um, no. So if I were to add an IP address to ETH0, connected routes, it knows what to do. Because because the interface is enslaved, if you were adding additional routes on top of that, you would have to tell it. So I just added one one one. Oops, let's try that again. So adding that to, um, to ETH zero, and then I do a route listing on the management table. And let me add it again. Maybe I messed something up there. Yeah, see, it gets added by default because it knows where to go. But if you wanted to add, you know, IP route add to that to the, uh, you got to tell it table VRF management. So the other thing is now that we've you got the routes, you've got packets that can come in and get directed to processes, but now how do you get out? So getting out gets a little more complicated with what's in there today. So you can use socket marks, you could use um, preloaded libraries to set the, the socket binder device for you. What I wanna, what I've been pushing from the model is to use a C group uh, an, uh, an L3M dev C group that essentially would allow you to set a task into a particular domain and then any child process it runs is already bound to that domain. So for example, let's take a bash shell into the, the management domain. So now So why did my script <coughs> go? <coughs> oh, I see what I did. I'm using a shell script that expects one thing, and I didn't take that out. So anyway, now it'll work. OK, so now. And I have this convenient PS1 helper that tells me, oh, now I'm set into the management VRF. 
So when I go to use networking, anything I do by default is going out management interface. So I don't have to do bind behind the scenes the C group is saying, oh, well, this task belongs to this L3 domain. I'm going to set the socket bind the device for you. So any INET or INET 6 sockets are going to get there by default. Do you have any uh, IPsec, for example? Would it be possible to tie it to VRM? Yes. If you want to say yes. SPDs for VRM? Yes. And, okay. Yeah. You have to set, there's a setting you have to pass in that tells it that it's associated with the domain. But yes, I've tested IPsec as well, the kernel implementation. XFRM didn't use to take an interface. It, this, uh, I'm sorry? XFRM, like policy or whatever, didn't use to take an interface for the transform. Has that been added? No, there's a selector. There's a selector piece. So um, I mean, if you want to steal the packets. So when stealing the packets, yes, but when you actually do the transform and output the packets on the wire, it, you, it was only like source and destination. Like the template was only source and destination. No. Or maybe it was having an SPD. No, no, I, I know this works, so let me, uh, I'll find the notes. If you look at the man page of IP, except for SPD. All right, well, that can't be done. Oh, it can used to be done. Okay. <coughs> because what I found was uh, Raccoon, the current code of Raccoon doesn't do it, so I had to go to um, my own. I had to hit, do this the transforms directly to get to get it to work. Yeah, so temple source. Yeah, so see that that statement there. Which one? So the yeah, that one where it says uh, template source peer. Oh, there we go. Yeah. yeah. Um, that, I mean, I. So I didn't have to make any changes to the IPsec code other than have it acknowledge that if the OIF is an L3, use that OIF in the route lookups, in the transform yes, lookups. Yes, you can't set the OIF, I think, in the syntax. There was no way to do it, I think. But, you know, that's not a problem with DRS. It's Oh, it doesn't work today. Well, it, it, yeah, like I said, from, from an implementation perspective, the only thing I had to do yeah. to, uh, to get IPsec working mm -hmm. was to uh, have, oh, have the transform lookup code acknowledge OIF and pass that into the FIB rules, into the, um, um, the lookup. Okay, so if you could so, configure it, it would work. Yes. Oh, good. If you had the ability to configure it, yes, it yeah, works. Yeah, yeah. So that's where I, I gave up trying to modify IPsec tools because it was just a nightmare. Yeah, there's no Netlink like and to configure it. I think it's just very, but you know, we could add that. I think so, yeah. It's like you have to tell it, like when you're transforming into this like template, here's the source and destination address you want to use. It should say at least, you know, here's, here's, here's the OEF you also need to use or the mark or whatever. So I haven't run that simulator in since. Mark is only in the select right thing. I haven't run that simulator since uh, uh, August. <laughs> Otherwise, I would spin it up for you and show you the, the policies. All right, so now let's move on to another use case, which is, um, so this is just summarizing what I was saying. By default, any kind of command you run is going to use um, the main table, and so it's going to want to go out the front panel ports. So if you want to do something going out management interface, you've got a variety of options, all of which kind of stink at the moment from the preload library or having to modify the source code to acknowledge bind. <coughs> Hopefully I can get this C group thing resolved soon and we can have a, a more elegant way of saying run this command in an L3 domain and all the magic happens. As, a, as a someone who's totally ignorant of C groups, is that a superset of per process? Like, can I have like nested C groups, or can a process be only in one C group? From a VRF perspective, I'm restricting it to a single, no nesting of VRF domains. No, my but it's going to be nested, but a process can only be in one. Okay, so then you have to have like you have to multiply. It. So, three use C groups for various kinds of things. 
So if I want to have like a per a per process BRF, then it has to be. Then I have for each of the scheduling C groups that I already have, I need scheduling C group A. Oh, no, 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 no. The scheduling C groups can be totally separate from networking C groups or LP and C groups. Oh, like sorry. Separate things. Thank you. So what I've got here, the implementation I have here, limiting it to a single when you drop a particular task, so in this case, it's the shell that is in the C group, and then anything it spins off is also in the C group. So that's, that's the characteristics and the properties that are very nice that I want to keep with C groups, which is why I think that model works really well. Um, so I don't know if that's, it sounded like you were going after something else, but. No, I think that's the answer, mostly. Yeah. Okay. So another common deployment is using VLANs to separate traffic, and then as a part of the VLAN deployment, you get to, to routers where you want to start separating your traffic by VRFs so that it, uh, it can, you know, move through the backbone of the network and, and still maintain that separation with the, with the VLAN stuff. So here's an example. Um, VLAN separation, you know, say you got a couple of racks and there's some hosts on each rack that are in one VLAN, VLAN 10, another set of hosts that are in VLAN 20, and as they're talking through a shared network, um, maintain that routing separation. So I have a simplified version of that deployment where I've got two groups of hosts. So group one, host one through four, are on VLAN 10. Group two, host one through four, are on VLAN 20. And all the traffic gets routed through a common set of R1, R2 routers. So I will look at, you know, when I, when I get onto the, the virtual machines, I'll show you the VRF10, VRF20 setup. And when the traffic's flowing, you can see how it flows through the, the, proper, um, the proper ports. So for this one, I do have my uh, handy dandy ASCII diagram. So this is showing and that's the MPLS one, so let me find the VLAN one. Okay. So here we've got the host at the top, all connected into switch one. The the bridge for these switches, so in this case, 10.1.1.254 for group one, 10 2, 1, 254 for group two. Those are the default gateways for the hosts. And they both come into switch one. It'll use R1 and R2 as that backbone to get over to the other rack where S2 is the top of rack switch. And it's gonna be talking to these hosts down at the bottom. So the, the router pieces, R1 and R2, when the VLAN 10s come into those routers, there's the, the routing lookup is done by separating the traffic, the VRF interfaces into separate, I'm sorry, the VLAN interfaces into separate VRFs so that the VLAN trunk here, um, when the packets pop out one into the other, they get you know, sorted back out into the proper channels. So. All right, so this is group one, host one, and I'm gonna ping the other end of that, which is group one, host three down here. So obviously the traffic's gonna work, or my demo is gonna blow up on me. So now let's go to, say, R1 and look at So in this case, what we've got for interfaces, so this is looking at that first R1. We have three front panel ports, two VRF groups, VLANs, VLAN 10 and VLAN 20 on both uh, 
the switch port one, which is the one that's shared between the two routers. Switch port two is connected to, it's coming back to this diagram, and we're on this. So switch port one is the common interface. And so it's got VLANs, both VLANs rep represented. Switch port two only connects to VLAN 10. Switch port three only connects to, to VLAN 20. So from a um, routing perspective, So here we've got the two VRF groups, and if we look at the table for group one, you can see the two interfaces are in there, and the table for group two, you've got the switch port one and the switch port three VLAN representations. From a traffic movement perspective, if I were to connect to, let's say, switch port two, okay, now when I'm pinging, okay, so I only see the traffic coming in the interface here. I don't see anything coming out three, which is, is appropriate since I'm connecting on VLAN 10. Going over to router two. So looking at then this interface, so the traffic should be coming from this host up here on the upper left through BR1, switch port two, switch port one on R1, and then coming down to this guy over here. So that's how you get that, you, know, you see that separation of Yeah, so there's the traffic. And on switch port three, I see nothing because I'm not doing routing on VLAN 20, which hits VRF 20, which goes in a different direction. <coughs> so all kind of boring considering this is the kind of the background infrastructure controlling the connectivity and the route lookups and, and such. So any questions on this one? This is kind of more of that really behind the scenes deployment setup. I guess my question is, what's what's new on the kernel side here? Like all this all this routing table IP rule stuff has been around for quite a while. Yes. We're making heavy use of it, but which aspects are actually new? The VRF device and the aggregating all of those individual concepts into a little more of a um, usable solution. So, for example, the existing infrastructure was that that was there couldn't can't handle um, duplicate IP addresses. But with VRF devices and using that as a construct for properly separating the traffic and properly doing the route lookups, directing the route lookups, you can have, uh, and actually my MPLS demo in the next one, it purposely has um, duplicate, duplicate address information and it shows how the two tables exist simultaneously. That's why you need the actual. Yeah. Yes? And David, what, what is new that wasn't possible in, in, Net, in NetNS? So in this case, so net namespaces are separating things at a device layer. And it is certainly possible to do VRF implementation yeah, using namespaces. I, I used to do for, uh, sure. Right. But with net namespaces, when you, so let's look at LLDP there, right? So a lot of switches, we're running LLDP from um, a wiring perspective, okay? If you use network namespaces to create your VRFs, which is an L3 concept. 
your L2 applications are impacted. Your L2 applications no longer see those, those interfaces, and so you have to replicate. Oh, we can still have an application running on multiple machines. Sure, but you have to get that presence in multiple namespaces. It doesn't happen automatically. You can't have an LLDP that's happily looking at all the switch ports in, in a switch you create a separate namespace, it's going to lose any devices that get moved into that until you do something. Yeah, right? but if we lose that in the application, then we get the runs, and then switch to do it. Sure, sure. I, that's, that was the long-running debate is, oh, verbs can be implemented with ne uh, network namespaces. But that is an extremely heavyweight solution, and you, know, you guys have gone through the pain and, and suffering of making that happen, so you know the cost and the overhead of doing namespaces as a VRF versus other implementation methods for VRFs. This one has proven to be, you know, a very lightweight solution. So the only cost to this is this additional net device structure that's hanging around. And then we want to come along and layer um, virtual switch separation, so having a lot of front panel ports that we create small virtual switches and then still maintain that ability to do nested VRFs inside of VLAN or inside of uh, of namespaces. We can do, um, you know, aggregation of these different concepts to create um, options and deployment scenarios where you know virtual switches, VLANs, VRFs, you know, different different um, techniques for I guess creating what you want to get to, right? Doing cross VRF. Right, and cross VRF routing with this works just fine. It, all you have to do is insert a rule in one table pointing to the other VRF device and the route lookups cross VRF domains. Yes? How does this integrate with IP tables? So you could put IP table rules on the VRF device, for example. Right now, on the ingress, you lose visibility to the original ingress device. We have thoughts on how to fix that so that you could put IP table rules on ingress devices as well as VRF aggregate, you know, the aggregation device. Yeah, the same problem we have with the morning or three. What? Losing the, the slave. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes. <clears throat> um, regarding the comparison to network namespaces, uh, let, let's assume, let's say you have uh, 4,000 VRFs, mm -hmm. 4,000 network namespaces. From your presentation, I understand that I have to create 4,000 IP tables uh, rules for the uh, ingress path. Mm -hmm. So did you <clears throat> try to put something like 4,000 VRFs and check the performance difference between using your solution with so much IP table rules compared to network namespaces which do not have to make lookups for 5,000 IP table rules? So I have not done it from an IP tables perspective. If you look at the overhead of creating 4,000 namespaces versus creating 4,000 VRF devices, it's hands down the VRF device is lighter by orders of magnitude. Right, so a namespace came in you know, in the hundreds of K, just creating the namespace. And you haven't even moved devices around, you haven't set up additional processes, you haven't opened additional sockets, you haven't done all the overhead that goes with having an extra namespace. Where for a VRF device, when you want to create that domain, you pop up the device, your processes, for example, with the VRF global option, you don't have to replicate anything. You don't have to create another Quagga instance, you don't have to do another LLDP instance, it just works. But after, let's say it takes one hour, after that one hour passed and everything is up, mm -hmm. the question is, you know, the, the packet forwarding rate, at least for the ingress, mm -hmm. how is it affected when you have 4,000 rules and IP tables to inspect versus in network namespaces, you don't need the rules at all? Well, you don't mean IP tables, you mean the IP rule. Yeah. Okay, okay. So yes, now we are aware of the linear lookups for FIB rules. So yes, we do know that that's something that needs to be optimized and looked at. So, so far we haven't seen 
any kind of performance degradation with the existence of the VRF device and running um, packets through. Certainly latency increased a bit because you're doing more processing on a packet as it detects that it's on an L3 master device. From a throughput perspective, no impact at all. From a CPU, you know, additional processing CPU perspective, um, a small bump in additional CPU resources used. So it's, I mean, it's, it comes down to being a trade-off. Yes? And I think it is, it is reflected to the kernel, uh, to, the, to the hardware, to true hardware, there is no impact because right. the, right. the IP table is not influenced in the hardware, it's just the slow part. That right. And that's an important aspect of this. You know, we're coming at this from the hardware offload, where the only thing that's going to hit those fib rules is things that got punted to the CPU to do software forwarding. And this maps very well to the hardware offload. And about the C groups, I mean, what you let's say you take the example of 4,000 uh, namespace, uh, what's your cost of getting 4,000 C groups? I mean, that, that, I haven't created the 4,000 C groups. I, I should do that. Um, the C group controller, the L3 MDEV controller, is extremely small, sort of lightweight. I can't imagine that specific, specific um, controller consuming a lot of memory. But yes, I do need to go through the, the, the process of creating 4,000 of them just to show, to, I guess, to either confirm or, or you know, see what the issues are with creating 4,000 of them. Um, you know, the fact that you're creating 4,000 of anything, there is going to be some overhead, be it namespaces, be it net device, be it C groups. Um, you know, I, we, we do think that this solution, that this design of the options has been extremely resource efficient. And, you know, it, if we hit roadblocks, we'll certainly do what we can to, to fix those roadblocks. But from a starting point, we're starting off fairly efficient. What, why would you ever need 4,000 C groups? Because you're, you kind of said this is for the management applications that you're running inside of those, if you're just forwarding. Well, so in this case, you look at this. This is, this is getting into data plane VROFs as opposed to a management VROF. In data plane VROFs, it is common to have thousands of VROFs. Right, but if you're just forwarding, mm -hmm. you're just kind of, mm -hmm. what are you running inside of them? You may run some DHCP services or things like that sometimes. When, it, um, when process uh, sends packets through a VRF device, it goes through the rules and sees the OIF rule and goes mm -hmm. through the appropriate table. And the, um, in the appropriate table, is the device the original underlying device? And if so, does pack packets actually flow through the VRF device on egress? Yep. And if not, is TCP dub asymmetrical? <laughs> so it's getting both. So if you look here, I can get both ingress and egress packets. So, so, are yeah. the so if you look at from a packet handling perspective, as a part of the L2 RX handler, the <coughs> device is getting switched from the original ingress. It sees that, oh, this is an enslaved one. I'm going to flip it to the VRF device. That's before it hits packet sockets. So that's how it's getting done on the ingress. And then on the egress, when the first route lookup is done, we're returning a DST that points into the VRF driver. So the VRF device takes control of that packet. And so you'll see it hit the packet socket lookups once, and then it switches the device over to the real one that it's going to go out of and reinserts it into the stack, and then it goes out. And you'll see it on the ETH, you know, the actual front panel port that it's going to go out on. So the asymmetry, I think, is on that SWP port. Because you lose it when you actually no, we still no no it's it's still there, because it hits, it hits the the SWP port on ingress. It'll hit the SWP port before it, the RX handler, and then it gets switched. So it's still some it's symmetric there too. <coughs> Yes. Manually specifying the rules right. to go 
Right. And that's what I think shows up in the latency aspects. When you do um, like a net perf RR, because it, it is doing some extra processing. Where for a throughput, it catches up. You know, all that minimize, all that overhead gets amortized over a lot of packets and they're getting fed through pretty quick with the, um, the GRO and GSO stuff. And I guess really quickly, I'm running out of time here. And the last one I was going to show was MPLS. So we also have an MPLS demo set up. Same kind of concept where you have hosts. I guess I can show this diagram better. Where you've got racks coming into some router that have a shared provider backbone, and you want to maintain traffic separation as it goes through the backbone. In this case, um, I wanted to show how this VRF implementation, getting at the what's not capable, what can you not do with the existing bib rules and multiple tables. So in this case, I've got duplicate address information coming into the Provider Edge 1 router. And when you look at to switch simulators. So we'll come into PE one. <coughs> So here you've got the two different VRFs for the two different customers that are going to separate that traffic. Uh, Diagram-wise, uh, SWP1 is customer 1, SWP2 is customer 2. Um, when I look at SWP1, it's got the 112 address. SWP2 also has the exact same address, but I'm not going to have any conflicts with that because I've got all those routes are in completely separate tables. So when I get on this box and I tell it to do something a little more fancy, so the, the, the hosts have no concept of the VRFs or anything <coughs> else. So if I SSH into this 88213 address, for example. <clears throat> See, now I just jumped from C1H1 to C1H3. And I've done that by going through the PE1, P, PE2 routers. So if I look at PE, oops, SWP1, so that's the packets going through it. And if you were to flip that TCP dump over to SWP3, you'll see it got converted into... Ah. <laughs> Wrong command! All right. Well, for a brief moment, we kicked out some packets, and you can see how it's done the MPLS side. I will have to... So I just lost host 3. I will have to kick into host 4. Good thing I had four of them. All right, so this is PE1, and let me hop on to PE2, which is where, so PE1, the, the packets are all getting pushed into the, a common trunk, the common backbone, and they pop out the other side on PE2. And then, I always have to keep my handy diagram here, so, SWP2, so SWP3 shows nothing as, as packets are, you know, the, the separation of the customers, um, you know, I'm on, a, I'm on customer one's host, so those packets don't make it through the customer two side of things. But if I go over to SWP2, 
I can see the SSH packets having gone through it. And then switching to that ingress side, which is front panel port one, you see the MPLS packets. So MPLS popped in. So MPLS popped in this interface. And it uses those labels to say, oh, well, this label goes over here to VRF 10, pops that label off, drops the packet into the VRF 10 route lookup, and it continues on its way up to CE1, the other edge router. From a route perspective, table VRF C1. So you can see the normal connected routes for that interface, and then there you've got the, the MPLS route as well. So again, the, 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 the theme here from a data plane perspective is you've got a shared backbone and the VRFs provide that routing separation at the ingress and the egress of that shared back, uh, backbone. Can you show how the uh, way uh, into the VRF uh, is configured, like how the label is popped in the VRF? You mean, uh, so like how this is configured down here? WPS1 and then IP routes LS table C1. So here's the yeah the ingress, you know, it's got the 112 interface. So this is a 111 network. So C1 E1 sends the packet up to, to PE1. Oh, I meant the reverse hierarchy. The reverse hierarchy. From the MPLS interface down into the VR. Uh oh, from, you mean so like this interface here where it's receiving the MPLS packets on SP3 and then flips them into, <coughs> sure. So here is that, the route that's going to cause the, this direction going <coughs> ingress down here at SWP1 and, you know, it receives the packet and then it wants to say my next, my next hop is here. This, two, this two, 2112 goes through SWP3. And then if I do the TCP dump on <coughs> SWP3, we'll run some packets through it. And you see the same thing where one label comes in, it pops it. So the 1112 label comes in, it pops it off, and sends the packet over to SWP1. So where did that label pop from? at the MPLS layer. So if I do a route lookup, uh, a route show on the MPLS family, you can see where it's pushing 1112 for this interface, or this, this address. Sorry, it gets complicated on this little bitty screen to show both the config setup and some of the so 111 111 here via 311 3112 here Yes. Well, no, no, no. So, yeah, the VRF is SWP2. That's the interface. And when it receives this, it pops it and then sends it on to this guy. And then the routing table. It, it sounds like on ingress, the input interface doesn't matter at all. No, it's the label that it's, that it's responding to to figure out what to do. Yeah, I'm just surprised it has as target uh, SWP2 and not worth C1. Yes, so that is something we know that there can, some of the labels can be VRF based. And we haven't gotten around to looking at that, but it is on our to-do list that the, the MPLS label is associated with the VRF. So yeah, that'll happen as well. Whether it works today, I don't know. But is it going to work? Yes, we, that is what we'll, we'll have on our to-do list. So any other questions on this one? I only got like a couple minutes left. 
Okay. So let me just uh, dump one more thing in you guys. So mm -hmm. interverf routing. So yeah, I mentioned that you can do, you know, you've got different tables for the different VRFs, and there's a lot of cases where you need packets to go from one VRF to another, and there's multiple ways to do that, like having an explicit rule that says, go from, you know, in table VRF red, I've got this network out dev eth2, which is in a different VRF, or you can do the bottom one, which basically says, in verf red, this network is reachable by verf green. So go, go to that table and do another look up to see where to send the packet. <laughs> any, any questions? So six one did a lot of good changes to the infrastructure of Quagga. So I personally am not a Quagga developer, so I personally didn't make any changes to it. But someone in the company, this, this, the changes that six one put into Quagga had done some good refactorings to support VRFs first via namespaces. And one of our engineers took that as a start point and did some refactoring so that it can be namespaces or a VRF device model so that we want the two to coexist. I think that's, yeah. Yep. All right, I think with. I have a question. So, do you, what happens if, if you have two interfaces in the VRF that have a default root? You can't. You, you, the table can only have one default route. Per family? Per family, yes. Sir.